My early childhood was spent in the home of Christian love. And uh, there, at the age of five, I contracted diphtheria. These were in the 1920s. Insulin had just been discovered. There was no cure for polio myelitis. There was uh, some indication that there would be vaccines for other things. I had diphtheria. One morning I woke up and I couldn't swallow my breakfast of a muffin and condensed sweet and condensed milk. I told my mom I can't swallow this. And so she called the doctor. The doctor came. He had been working in India, he was experienced in diseases, infectious diseases, looked down my throat and had a grim look on his face, which told me that I was not in good shape. He went to his office, got a big needle and gave it to me with my mother sitting on one end of me and my dad on the other, and he saved my life. Although the disease meant that my father couldn't come into our home for six, six weeks. However, at that point in time, I wasn't thinking about dying, although it looked as though I might. I was thinking about going to school and look happily, getting into kindergarten, getting into school with all the kids on my street. Therefore, I realized that I was mortal. I hadn't thought of dying before. In fact, I wasn't ready to die because I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, as my parents did. The other thing I decided at that point in time was that this doctor had saved my life. And I thought that that was a skill I'd like to learn. And by God's grace, I would uh, become a doctor if he so led me. I uh, got over the diphtheria and uh, subsequently went swimming in the Don River. And one day I got over my depth and panicked and uh, nearly drowned. And that was another indication to me that uh, life could be very short. One day I was walking down Broadview Avenue with my father, and having nearly drowned, I uh, was afraid of water, and so I asked my dad, do you have to be baptized to be saved, to be, have your sins forgiven? And he told me about the story of the thief on the cross who was dying for his sin, and could not be baptized, couldn't join the church, could do nothing to save himself, but he asked the Lord Jesus Christ, who was dying on one of the crosses too, uh, whether he would be remembered in heaven Remember me this day when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus Christ with his own lips promised him that that day he would be in heaven without baptism and without anything else except simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ's life. Shortly after that, I went to a service in which Mr. Moneypenny from Ireland was preaching the gospel at South Broadview Gospel Hall. He had a big chart there and uh, it, on the chart were two roads and two destinies. The entrance to the roads was from birth, and the destinies were life with God forever, or life with God forever. And so the choice was made at the cross, and I made my choice that night, knowing that I was on the wrong road to a life without God, not having committed any great sin, but I needed to be saved, and I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that night I had the relief of my sins forgiven, my eternal life through Jesus Christ, and so that night I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Subsequently, I went to high school, and uh, there my father told me, they that honor me, I will honor. And this is a truth that I've learned during my life, that uh, honoring God will be honored by him. And so in my life at high school, I never opened a book on Sunday, and uh, all through university, I never opened a textbook either. Instead, I taught Sunday school and other things that were more essential on the Lord's Day. I joined the Air Force in 1944 uh, because uh, everybody else was joining up and the war was nearly over. And uh, I joined an air crew and served as a wireless air gunner, a radio operator air gunner. Although I didn't get overseas, I got my wing and was discharged. There again, I proved God's goodness because I was safe from being uh, shot and killed in the armed forces. But I was entitled to time at university. And so when I went to university, I applied for medicine. And uh, when somebody asked me there, one of the officials, is your father a doctor? And I said, no. And is your uncle a doctor? No. 
He said, how do you expect to get into the University of Toronto? I was dismayed. I felt that God had led me to this point. I had good marks in high school, not excellent, but good ones. And uh, so I went to my elders in my church and I asked them to pray for me. 1,500 applicants from the armed forces and 150 were chosen and by God's grace, I was allowed in. At university, I enjoyed fellowship in the Varsity Christian Fellowship. And uh, although I could have become president, I had responsibilities in my home church, so I settled for being vice president there and enjoyed that. A return missionary from Angola came and talked to us, Mr. David Long, and he talked to the medicine students in medicine and the students, nursing students, and he said, that, you know, you're going to spend a long time in nursing, nursing and medicine training, uh, but if you come to Angola, you don't really need even to speak the language because the patient, is, you don't have to tell the patient to get undressed, he's already undressed. He's, and uh, he's got a string around his middle, you merely point to this, above the string, and if he says the pain is there, then you give him a dose of quinine or anti-malarial treatment because that's probably what the diagnosis is. And then if it's below the string, he's probably constipated and you give him a dose of Epsom salts. Well, he had the place in a roar, in an uproar, but I almost went on the first boat to Africa, but I didn't, I was glad I took training. In Africa, we uh, had much joy in serving the Lord in Angola. And uh, there I saw God's hand in miraculous ways. First one was, as we were studying the language, uh, it was necessary, first of all, to study Portuguese and then the Chokwe language, one of the African tribal languages. And as I was coming from my classes, a man and a woman, an African, were carrying their little baby who had just been born in their arms and saying, Mukwetu hafwa, Mukwetu hafwa, Monitu hafwa, Monitu hafwa. And uh, our friend, our baby, has died. And uh, I looked at the baby and it was, it was not breathing not having a stethoscope, I put my ear to the baby's chest and heard the heart beating. A thin plastic tube and suctioned up the uh, mucus from the child's throat and started to cry to the delight of everybody and that child grew up to be a lovely young lady. Another mission station in Angola. Uh, we were working with a Chokwe chief in the operating room and he had come in overnight and uh, with an ax blow to his Achilles tendon. Put him on the operating table and uh, started to suture when uh, my, op my operating room boy said, Mwata uh, Mukwetu Hafwa, the man had stopped breathing or that he was dead. I listened to his heart and it stopped and uh, then got a large needle and plunged some stimulant into his heart directly and he sat up. And I said, okay, now I back down, we'll finish the surgery. What had happened during the night was that he had not only severed his tendon, but had severed some of his blood vessels in the ankle area and bled profusely. My third experience there with God's goodness was being on another mission station again without any equipment at all. And the missionary there, Robert Taylor, told me that he had a woman in labor for a week and she had not made any progress. And that if he took her to a hospital by car or by truck, both she and the baby would be dead, and I agreed with him. So I said, well, any instruments I can work with? Have you got any anesthetic? Well, he had some tubes of dental anesthetic, and he had three snaps to stop blood vessels. We proceeded, I told him, the missionary and his wife to go into the home and, and pray for us, and my wife and I started this there in section by freezing the abdominal wall with dental anesthetic and subsequently delivering a healthy baby. And uh, God was good because he did answer prayer and these instances showed me that we're in God's hands and he was blessing the work. I uh, subsequently came home to Canada and uh, was privileged to work in another hospital and there again I was working with uh, six Christian doctors, all of whom believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. <coughs> And although we had differences of opinion on many things, we had one common thing. We knew our sins forgiven by Jesus' grace, and we knew that we were serving him in this way. Dr. Paul Roberts, who suggested that I not spend my time doing further surgery, which would have meant going downtown to Toronto and being away from my home, were the uh, privilege of making house calls and family practice was worthwhile. So I did that, 
and I was privileged to make many house calls in my time and uh, be blessed greatly. So that is my testimony, and I thank God that on three continents, in Portugal, studying Portuguese, and in England doing tropical medicine, and in Africa in, for 10 years as a medical surgeon, and also in back in Canada, I saw God's hands working with me in giving me a wonderful family of four daughters, all of whom are married to four Christian men, and six grandchildren and one great-grandchild. All blessings from the Lord. Amen.